Welcome to DTS 109, and I guess not really much happened this week, you know? Or did it? You're listening to Destiny the Show. What's up, everybody? It's BBK Dragoon here. Destiny the Show 109, the Destiny News Podcast to keep you, the Guardian, ahead of the game in the world of Destiny. Joining me, as always, is my awesome host, Diddy. How you doing, man? Doing all right. Walked a lot yesterday, but now it's time to talk about some Rise of Iron details absolutely tons to talk about you and i actually the night that the 16 page game informer article came out about three four hours later it was on a tuesday after our podcast it went live we sat down we recorded a 20 minute video going over all the game informer stuff but more has come out this week and we're going to be going through all of it for our listeners so stick around guys it's going to be a big show News. Okay, did he break it down for me? What was this week like? For some context, let's say somebody was living in a hole or they just got back from vacation. Where is all this information coming from? Game Informer. They have their September cover story on Rise of Iron. So all this week, Game Informer has been releasing tons of details about Rise of Iron. What you get to experience, all the additions that they're adding into the world of Destiny, what it's like on the current gen console only, and... Just where Destiny's going for the next uh, year or so. We also, in addition to the news from Game Informer, had the quarter two investors earning call from Activision Blizzard, which had some pretty impressive numbers, as well as the fact that they made over a billion dollars. It was like $1.5 billion in three months, which is just pretty wild when you start putting the pieces together. So let's start off with the main backbone information that we got. What's coming with Rise of Iron at the most basic level? So, at a glance is what Game Informer called it. They had just bullet points, and I'm going to do those bullet points here. Five mission campaign plus additional missions and quests. Fellwinter Peak is the new social space. Plaguelands is the new patrol area. The Devil Splicers, finally the name of the new enemy. The Archon's Forge, which is a new cooperative arena, uh, basically Court of Oryx and Prison of Elders combined. Um, new and reimagined strikes. Wrath of the Machine is the name of the new raid. Reinvented Artifacts. New Light Level, which is going to be 385. And then when the Hard Mode Raid launches, that'll drop up to 400 Light Level gear. Now, you're getting new gear as well. Armors, weapons, that kind of thing. Ornaments. Basically, armor and weapon modifications or augmentations. Supremacy, which is the new Crucible game mode. Uh, Four new Crucible maps and reinvented Iron Banner, so a little bit different stuff there for the Iron Banner. They're removing the tempered buff, and it's going to be easier and quicker to reach max rank. Diddy and I both subscribed to Game Informer so we could check out the 16-page mega article. And man, it went into detail about a lot of great things, but the backbone of Rise of Iron is content. That's the word that was echoed throughout the entire piece, as they're looking to give players a lot of things to do. Now, Diddy, five campaign missions feels a little bit small Mm -hmm. to me but really if i think about the taken king my long form enjoyment from questing experiences came from the in-depth long form quest lines rather than the missions i've gone back through the missions as you have as we've leveled our characters and it doesn't take all that long to get through the taken king missions but what does take a long time are the quests so what do you feel about five missions too small it's smaller than I expected, but I don't think it's too small because, you know, let's be honest. The only time that we go back and replay these story missions that come out with each expansion is when it's like the daily heroic mission or exactly. if it's the the secret Black Spindle, Lost to Light um, daily story mission, those kinds of things. And the replayability or the playability comes from those quest lines. And like we said in our 20 minute uh, separate video, the quest lines they introduce they have story mission nodes that 
add into the patrol area. So you can go back and play those specific story missions um, that relate to that quest line whenever you want. Uh, and so I think that's a really good thing, you know, just adding into that whole new patrol map. And they said in the Game Inform article that the missions, the story missions, they borrow from the Taken King structure in terms of storytelling and how it's all like that. Uh, and it opens up multiple end game quests and activities. So new exotic quests, pursuit of new uh, artifacts, which we'll talk about a little bit later, and there's a quest line that leads into the new strike. So after you beat the story missions, it's just going to open up this wide array of end game activities. Totally. And what I think is interesting there is they've learned from the Taken King, there will be secrets. We already know that there are secrets scattered about the plague lands, and in fact, in the patrol play space. I don't know if people aren't interested in any spoilers. It's not a big one. But they actually have chests in the space that are like mimics from Dark Souls. And these chests will actually kind of betray you when you open them and have some sort of negative repercussion. We don't know what that might be. Maybe it means you get poisoned and you have to go cleanse yourself. Maybe it means you just instantly die. So I find that pretty cool. And you mentioned the daily missions that we play with the Taken King that led to things like, you know, the exotic weapons that we could pick up for those time dailies. You know for a fact they're going to be back in with Rise of Iron. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and again from the Game Informer article, Bungie embraces player choice in the first game's concluding year. So the Destiny 1, this is its final year, and they're embracing player choice. That's really relevant or you know apparent with the new content, and they're adding in everything. They want to tell a different kind of story. Taken King is all about revenge and hunting down the big bad monster. House of Wolves is about tracking down criminals that betrayed the queen. Now we're learning about the story of a figure that we're familiar with, which is Lord Saladin and the Iron Lords. Um, the battles we've been fighting in the Iron Banner, they've been preparing us for the day that Siva returns, and September is going to be that day. So let's talk real quickly about the reimagined strikes. We have the Summoning Pits, which is going to be now called Abomination Heist, which sounds pretty cool. And the Devil's Lair, which is going to be called Sepex Perfected, they're both getting sort of a remix, and they're going to they're going to have a lot of Siva enemies. And Sepex even himself becomes a big Siva version. They've had new scripts and voice acting for both of them, so it sounds like they're going to get a very proper uh, treatment to them. And I'm actually totally blanking. Do you remember the name of the new strike that we're getting? Oh gosh, I don't. That's okay. You can Google it real quick, or I can Google it real quick, but. It has multiple pathways, and through repeated playthroughs of the new strike, you're going to experience different enemies and different fights that give it an extra element of replayability, which I'm excited about. And heck, the Summoning Pits and Devil Slayer, nostalgia. They talked about nostalgia a lot in many of the video interviews with some of the directors for Rise of Iron, and that's a backbone, is trying to let players really enjoy this final year three moment where we look back and we see the Cosmodromes change. We even look at Saladin, who's very morose and kind of sad in, in the videos that we've seen of him. Could there be some reasons for that? Yeah, we're diving more into the Iron Lord's background and why Saladin is the only remaining one. Saladin also, he has his helmet removed, so it becomes more personal interaction. And in a bunch of the cutscenes, he shows Saladin interacting with our Guardian. So there's going to be dialogue between those two. I, that's the kind of story that I'm interested in, something that I can connect with. Totally. Now, the new social space we've finally gotten to see, Fell Winter Peak, it looks pretty cool, and there are actual wolves in there. Can't pet them. Unplayable. Can't pet them? Cancel what? your pre-orders now. You cannot pet the wolves in the social space. Did Bungie, like, just not think of anything, <laughs> man? What is they probably cut the pet emote out and they're gonna sell oh it gosh. to us at a later date, man. <laughs> I <laughs> so like money. them. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about the Archon's Forge. It's a new cooperative arena that's kind of a synthesis of Court of Oryx with Prison of Elders. It will be available once you've completed the campaign and gone through some of the longer quest lines in Rise of Iron, and it's gonna be in the Plague Lands, and essentially it's a replayable activity. And it is player triggered, and you basically go into the Plague Lands. And you work together with a fire team as, I think it's like a five-minute wave-based survival mm -hmm. thing. And 
as many people in the patrol space as you want can join, however many the max instance allotment is for that patrol space, which sounds very cool because, let's face it, Court of Oryx, I think, was a really cool concept, but not necessarily executed in a way that was accessible. I know there were plenty of times where you probably needed a fragment, and you're like, hey, let's go run Court of Oryx, and you sat around waiting for a couple other mm-hmm. people to show up so that you could take on that, you know, tier three court, right? Yeah, exactly. This court of works is awesome, but the fact that it didn't always give you people to do that with kind of made it fall flat. But now with the Archon's Forge, it seems like, like we said, we can just go into the Plague Lands Patrol and we can run over to the Archon's Forge, very similar to Court of Oryx, and do these encounters with anybody with people on our fire team or randoms that just show up in the patrol area plus with excuse me legacy consoles drops maybe the player uh, max limit is way more instead of nine it's going to be 50 can you imagine (laughs) 50 (laughs) guardians playing the archons forge it's awesome that that's what i dream about when we think destiny 2 i really look forward to the days where we can have 20 man raids and you truly are fighting these behemoths together maybe 20s a little bit higher but okay wow rating is 25 man but 18 guardians on a single raid and then you could design raids to have three different sizes in mind some that are just very large scale that require coordinated dps i mean could you imagine everybody popping their super at once just trying to damage a boss during a small window golgoroth would be down in a single bubble way easier than (laughs) it is now (laughs) oh goodness so speaking of raids what do we know about wrath of the machine we're going to get a video interview with game informer in the next week that's going to talk about the raid but not spoil the important things they they throw around the word collision like thematically the new raid is all about collision and unlike previous raids there's a fair bit of outdoor action which i think is awesome and you can see the area from other parts of the plague lands so similar to vault of glass if you're patrolling venus you can run through that space where vault of glass where you're um rising raising the spire and you can see a raid team and you can help them out i remember actually uh, in house of wolves we were doing vault of glass some dude just ran over and gave us a scorch cannon that's cool. And so we took Scorch nice Cannon into the Templar as well, and it was so beneficial. So shout out to that guy. Um, so similar like that, you can see the people doing the raid, hopefully. Totally. Our new light level cap is 385. I don't remember what we placed our bets on. I think you were 360, right? Weren't you like 360, 370? Uh, yeah, I didn't think we could get up to 400. Okay. I bet 420 for internet memes. <laughs> But it ends up being 385, and when hard mode comes out, the max will be 400, and it looks like the raid is releasing the Friday after Rise of Iron comes out. So Rise mm-hmm. of Iron will come out on Tuesday. Do make note, if you guys are planning on taking work off, Rise of Iron will not go live, I believe, until 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Mm-hmm. So yep. you may want to take Wednesday off if you're planning on taking a day off at all. That way you get the most bang for your buck and use your time the best way possible. Same thing with the launch of the raid as well. When it comes out Friday, it's typically that time as well. 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Mm -hmm. And I know you're going to be working with the Pineapple Boys trying to get world first again like you guys did with King's Fall. You were in the lead there for a little (laughs) bit. At Golgoroth, I think you guys were in the lead. We were one of the first past the War Priest, and then we hit Golgoroth like a ton of bricks and it was <laughs> four hours after that we beat it but uh hopefully this time we'll we're not essentially specifically trying for worlds first but that crew likes to raid quickly so if it happens it's gonna happen this time i am going to make a prediction here that i believe wrath of the machine is going to be quite a bit less complicated than some of the fights in king's fall And I just say that because I don't think it's going to be as tech or require as many movement mechanics as, let's say, the final Oryx fight. The final Oryx fight is fantastic, but watching players bumble through trying (laughs) to figure out how to do it, it got so painful. I was like, oh my word, this thing is complicated. Yeah, first time learning the Oryx fight, it's 
you do like seven different things and then you're halfway done. And then you have to figure out that eighth step and then you had to get that eighth step after all the seven and then it's it's a lot of tech there. Totally. Now artifacts are getting an overhaul in terms of their usefulness. Now artifacts are going to be representative of a particular Iron Lord and you're going to have to work towards getting them. And each of them have their own unique ability that modifies gameplay to an extent. Diddy and I talked about this earlier this week, but I want to go through some of the ones that we know about just yet. I bet there's going to be a couple that we don't know about that we'll be learning when the game releases, but they're all modeled after the Iron Lords. And the first one is Memory of Perun. And this adds the ability to highlight guardians with full super in yellow and guardians with low health in red. Now in Crucible, this is probably going to be the whole story for every one of these uh, artifacts. For me, in PvE, awesome. In PvP, I worry about how they're going to be balanced. So when I hear about highlighting players, I think of the hunted thing. And Diddy, you're a Night Stalker. What is hunted? Whenever you damage or scope in and target an enemy, there's a little X. You have to specifically be using a Night Stalker and have the hunted perk. Um, there's a little X that pops up on the enemy and it tracks them and it'll track them behind the wall for a few seconds so you can actually kind of see where they're going okay cool and this might do a same or similar thing maybe it won't highlight people behind walls we'll just have to wait and see next up we have the memory of yolder or jolder is it yolder did i think it's yolder yolder okay cool and this removes the sprint cooldown it's kind of silly right yeah, it just, this just means that the sprint cooldown is, in fact, intended in Destiny, and it's not going to be removed anytime soon. Sprint lock bugs people, man. It really does. I don't see the Harman removing it. Yeah, I don't know. I've died a few times in the Crucible because I've been jumping in the air after sprinting, and I mm. land, and I just can't sprint around the corner. Yeah. It sucks. It just feels inconsistent sometimes. Anyway, Memory of Fell Winter. You lose your super, but you gain an extra grenade, melee, and a boost to all stats. This one, again, we have to wait and see how big is that boost to the stats. Is it going to be like Crimson Doubles, that giant boost that you got when your teammate died? Or is it going to be something more subtle? What do you think? Um, I don't know. <laughs> Planet Destiny also says that orbs recharge both your grenade and melee at the same time so that's mm -hmm. it's going to be really beneficial there for people who really like their grenades and melees like uh like myself i like to throw grenades i see this on a titan like as titans are right oh, now God. and it really scares me like having that many lightning nades at their armamentarium and, and stack mm -hmm. yeah would, would it stack with armamentarium yeah we don't know it very scary the memory of gellion did i say it right gellion yeah Cool. Gain detailed radar at all times, radar, <laughs> including when aiming a primary. So it gives you third eye, basically. Precision radar and third eye. I like that. I like that one. And detailed radar, which means like the keen scout from the Night Stalker. So it's going to be yes. a little bit more um, accurate. You get an extra set of pizza pies for your <laughs> yep. radar. Exactly. The memory of Scory speeds up super recharge for all nearby allies. By how much? Who knows? But in Mayhem, this might get insane with certain builds. Dude. Stack this with St Song of Flame. Whew. Oh, interesting. The memory of Tamur. Melee an enemy for a chance to make them an ally for a short time. Now, this one on paper obviously won't work in PvP. In PvE, it's interesting. What happens if you melee charge somebody who is like a boss mob? The game wouldn't let the mob fight for you, do you think? <laughs> no, I don't think so. Um, Planet Destiny has a little bit more detailed uh, breakdown, and I believe they say it's specifically low-level minion, minions of Trash. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it lasts about 30 seconds or until your melee, or until you melee a new enemy. Okay. I did skip two of them that I wanted to come back to, and that's the Memory of Silmer, which dramatically reduces any damage dealt by damage over time effects. This one worries me. We know that Thorn is coming back for year three. That has been officially confirmed. And when I read this, I'm wondering if damage over time on Thorn might see a little bit of a buff. I think Wizanuski and his team, the guys who balance PvP and Destiny, 
have done a really good job. And I think they monitor the situation very carefully. I've enjoyed the weapon tunings that we've been getting about every three or four months quite a bit. But it seems like in year three, when you have an artifact like Silmer, anytime somebody complains about the thorn, you're going to be hit immediately with the auto-generated response of, well, you could be running the memory of Silmer, dude. There's no need to complain about this. Which, I'm just going to be frank, I don't like Thorn because the damage over time effect is so unique and it's not present in hardly anything else other than burn effect grenades. There's no other weapon that does what Thorn does. And they've scaled it back to a point where I don't think it's that egregious of an offender, but I still just don't like it that much, you know? Yeah, we've talked about damage over time effects in Crucible before on the podcast, and we've both agreed that it slows down the pace of the game dramatically. You tag somebody with a damage over time effect, they have to run behind the wall and wait until that stops and then wait for their shield to recharge. It's uh, it's annoying, yes, and this new artifact obviously is going to help those people being targeted by those damage over time effects, but like you said, it's just it's an annoyance that it just doesn't go away. Yeah. And the other one I skipped was the Memory of Radagast, which adds a new ability for sword heavy weapons to reflect projectiles, including ogre blasts and crucible rockets, and it will also reflect supers like Nova Bomb or the Night Stalker blast, which to me, hmm, I know it's relegated to just using the heavy weapon sword for this, but I don't like it unless... If you're wearing Radagast, you have some sort of visual indication that shows that you're wearing it. Because I'll feel mighty cheated if I throw a super at an opponent. Maybe actually, let's think about it this way. Maybe the indication is the fact that he's got a sword out. <laughs> and you have to think twice about throwing a sword at a super. I just feel like some of these artifacts have cool creative uses for PvE. But I worry about how they're going to be balanced in PvP. While I do trust Wizanuski... I think the leads on Rise of Iron said, hey, let's do these artifact things and brought them to the table before asking the question of, do these really fit into PvP smoothly? We're Jedi now. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> uh, the Stormcaller Storm Trance, I really hope I can reenact the uh, Star Wars oh Episode Three Revenge of the Sith scene with Mace Windu and actually defeat the Stormcaller. <laughs> because <laughs> you know i got i love the dark drinker um but yeah this this totally changes how people rush heavy ammo in the crucible you just get that one guy with the sword and that do that uh what they're what are they call void walkers they oh my gosh they blink up tag that nova bomb that dude with the sword nope boom and then just baseball bats it back at him and that's insane those kinds of moments are what make the crucible awesome but it's kind of like come on man i just ha had a super and you just deflected it with a sword yeah right yeah we'll see we'll see how this all fits in i guess i'm a little bit worried but wesnowski can handle this him and his team know what they're doing on the uh topic of crucible we're getting four new crucible maps one of those will be a playstation 4 exclusive and the new game mode that we're getting is supremacy they have a 6v6 version a Inferno version, and I believe there is a Rumble version, so an FFA Supremacy. And it's killed confirmed from Call of Duty, which means when you kill the opponent, they drop an orb, or I guess it's like a Engram-looking thing, and you have to pick that up to score. It's basically a team deathmatch, but it forces you to move a little bit more. I like it a lot. It's a great game mode, and I'm glad we're going to see it mm -hmm. uh, implemented into Rise of Iron. They're changing up Iron Banner quite a bit, Diddy. What's the main points there? Big changes of what has been revealed. Um, it's more accessible without losing the focus <laughs> of what works. So they're removing the tempered buff. And I th they think they say that you'll hit level 5 quicker than you would normally. Um, but you'll get to keep playing to earn those really cool rewards. And you'll get to wear whatever gear and whatever shaders you want. Yep, they're getting rid of the stacking reputation bonus for wearing emblem, class item, and shader, which is very cool. I like that a lot. It, it will be easier to get to rank 5. The speed up bonus for alternate characters once you've hit rank 5 on a single character will still be there. But they're overhauling a lot of the bounties, 
and I think they're going to try and improve the reward system just a little bit, but I know quite a few of the bounties are getting a full overhaul, which is great. That's awesome, and it fits the theme of what Rise of Iron is all about. Up next, I think I wanted to mention like one more thing. Oh, ornaments. These are pretty cool. What are they? Augmentations for your weapons and armor. So if you want to get that fur on your warlock robes, you can do that. So I can get those apple bottom jeans and the boots with the fur. <laughs> boots with the fur. Yep. <laughs> Absolutely. And they... the whole tower was looking at her. <laughs> they also mentioned that some exotics will have certain like weapon skins or different skins. You know, you can turn your Monte Carlo into a green, red, blue, purple version of itself. Things like that are what you can expect from ornaments. Totally. Yeah, that's pretty cool. So these it's weapon shaders. It's it's basically weapon shaders, and it will even apply to exotics. Very cool. You have to acquire them through endgame activities, though. I'm sure they will find a way, and we actually talked about this in the video, didn't we, that there will be some ornaments that are going to be in the new Sterling Treasure. I don't remember what it was called, but there will be a new Sterling Treasure type thing in Rise of Iron, and there is some ornaments and flair associated with those packages, but a lot of these are going to be tied to endgame activity rewards, right? Yes, and Eververse. And Eververse. Speaking of like rewards, I want to mention the awesome thing they're doing with strikes. If you're playing a strike, there's a chance at the end that you will get a key. At the end of every strike, there is a chest, and you can choose to use that key if you would like a shot at one of the strike uniques. So let's say I finish up the new devil's lair and I've earned a key from doing a strike sometime, you know, earlier that week and I go, I want the strike exotic helmet that's associated with devil's lair. I can choose to use that key and unlock the chest, which is gonna make farming those strike exotics kind of a thing of the past. You'll have people running the strike playlist and every once in a while you get a key, but then you get to choose what you spend that key on. That's so smart, man. Yeah, that's awesome. So the chest spawns very similar to the end of a boss encounter in a raid. Mm-hmm, exactly. What an awesome idea. So you're going to have people like for the grasp, you'd save up your keys, and then after doing uh the, oh, wow, um, Omni Goal Strike. <laughs> I, I couldn't remember the name of it, but then you can use the key Pick yourself up a grasp, and maybe one day you'll get a roll as nice as mine. Kappa. Kappa Kappa. While we're on the topic of rewards, they're also introducing a record book. Similar to mm -hmm. year for the two entire thing, Lomas right? Triumphs. Yeah, for the whole expansion. And this works very similarly to Moments of Triumph. After completing a certain activity or quest line, you will unlock a specific guaranteed reward. So about they say every 10% or so of completing the record book, you'll get that reward. So I think that's pretty sweet. That is very cool. All right. We got to mention before we get out of here that the Kvostov is coming back. And if you have your original year one Kvostov, you'll be able to break it down once Rise of Iron gets here to earn Kvostov weapon parts. And then it'll allow you to earn your new Kvostov a little bit quicker and it's interesting because it has three firing modes. It's probably the most customizable exotic we've seen before where you can have it behave like an auto rifle or a pulse rifle or a scout rifle. And you're given so many options that you basically get to tailor this Kvostov to the way that you want to play. I think it's cool and fits the theme of nostalgia. I'm not really losing my mind over it. I don't think it's that exciting, but I have heard players are deleting a character <laughs> just to get a year one Kvostov back and trying to level that third slot up really quick so that they, day one, can get a Kvostov part as fast as possible. Yeah, it's very similar to the way Sleeper Simulant works, where you have to acquire those four uh, Dravalian or Dravalian, um mm -hmm. weapon pieces, and that will kick off the quest line. And there's a breakdown of this Kvostov, exotic Kvostov, multiple locations throughout the internet, but you can customize which scope you want, the cracked one or the modern one. Uh, automatic burst fire or semi-auto. You can get, uh, th there's two perk trees like we're very familiar with. And then you can also change the rate of fire of the weapon. It can be um, 450 RPM or 900 RPM. This can be tweaked no matter which fire mode you're with. So you can have a bullet hose auto rifle or a slow firing auto rifle like the Soros regime. And then you can have... Uh, 
really fast firing pulse rifle like grasp with malik or something similar to the messenger from year one trials okay gotcha well i think we've hit all the big points for at least this first week i don't think there's anything giant that we're missing are we i don't think so either okay we'll be staying clued in to the game informer section of their rise of iron coverage there will be more videos coming out soon especially the raid video which i'm looking forward to hearing just kind of their thoughts and designs and maybe seeing some images i don't want to spoil too much and i think they understand that as well before we head out of here today i want to just maybe hit the the big bullet points of the activision earnings call and then maybe next week we can talk a little bit more about it. The, the big thing here is that Eric Hirschberg, who is the CEO of Activision Publishing, revealed that the majority of Bungie's focus has shifted to the Destiny sequel. And I quote, this was from the investor earnings call for quarter two that happened just this last week. And I quote, the majority of the team at Bungie is actually focused entirely on creating Destiny 2. Boom. There we go. And it's got a release date of sometime in 2017. It's believed it's going to be the back half of 2017, but the words Hirschberg used was Destiny 2. What do you make of this, Diddy? It's one of the first times we've officially seen it referred to as Destiny 2, which gets me really excited. The timing of it, though, they just say, like you said, sometime in 2017, and I think we can anticipate pretty well it's going to be fall, so September-ish. Yeah. It kind of worries me for year three destiny because the only thing we know so far rise of iron in september festival of the lost in october is returning sparrow racing league is returning in december and then nothing after that so we have somewhat of a roadmap. basically we have a driveway after uh rise of iron comes out i'd like to know more of course but knowing that most of the most of Punchy is focusing on Destiny 2. Kind of, I kind of understand that because, you know, they're finally developing for current-gen consoles only. So I would like to get more hands on deck there <laughs> than continuing to, you know, handle uh, Destiny 1 because that makes me think, okay, Destiny 2 is going to have a new engine and they want more people working in that new engine than year one through three of destiny maybe a refined engine i think it'll probably retain elements of what it has instead of a total overhaul but i get what you're saying i think honestly diddy that we're gonna see sometime next april something similar to rise of iron i really do since we found out that rise of iron production began in january and we know they were aiming for something about the size of house of wolves it's since become a bit bigger and more in depth than that I think we're going to see come to fruition, you could say, that leaked picture of the, what, what was it called? Comet, the Comet expansion thing. I believe there's still another Rise of Iron size DLC that'll come out next spring. I won't be shocked if it turns out the way that year two did, where it just goes on for a long while without not a full right. clear picture of what's going on. But I don't think they'll miss out on E3. The hype of E3 is too much for them to do a spring release of Destiny 2. <coughs> it's just my... <laughs> Excuse me. Yeah, that's true. You know, <laughs> or if, you know, they E3, they walk on stage, Destiny 2 is available now. <laughs> 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 That'd be the biggest mic drop moment of all time. It would be pretty cool. Well, we'll talk about the numbers of how many Overwatch players there are next week in terms of how much money they made, the monthly active users for Destiny, and all sorts of stuff that we can dive into for the Activision Earnings Blizzard call. Cool, man. I'm excited. I think we've just butted up against the end of our time frame, so we'll probably skip the pleasantries. In Destiny, what'd you do this week before we close the show, and where can people find your content? Did some trials, of course, with uh, On the Rusted Lands. Universal Remote, man. It's becoming more of a pain. Um, but... One note about Rise of Iron, the Wretched King is the name of the new strike. I finally found it. <laughs> Thank you. There we go. And uh, people can find me at twitter.com slash DiddyDTS and youtube.com slash Wooshness, W-O-O-O-S-H-N-E-S-S. -S. Very good. Yeah, we did our Rusted Lands trials run and the universal bro motes were everywhere. I will say that uh, I got to show you Sassy and Aura's setups, dude. We did a run last night and got flawless and... 
It's all about the setups. They have the cash money setups to shut that stuff down. Other than that, I think you guys can find our content on destinytheshow.com for all the links from today and more. You can go to our Discord, discord.me slash destinytheshow. We're playing with listeners and doing some PvP stuff, most notably or regularly over there. You can tweet us at destinytheshow. And pretty soon we're going to be streaming over on twitch.tv slash destinytheshow. Yep. And you can follow me at PBK Dragoon, same name on YouTube. Remember to check out our friends over at DestinyTracker.com, the best place to track your stats in the world of Destiny. All right, have a good week, everybody. Watch out for that Wrath of the Machine video, and we will see you next time.